All right, so we're going to open our Bibles to uh, the Gospel of John. We're going to we're going to start in chapter one. We're going to start in verse one. Rocky, is that pulled up in there? Thank you. All right, so now here's kind of the issue. Nope, we're going to go back. Sorry. We're going to start here with the Gospel of John because in this particular instance, I want you guys to know that initially when this letter was written out to the church, it was not titled the Gospel of John. Originally when this letter went out to the church, it was titled According to John. So this is John claiming that he is the, gospel, or the, the writer of the Gospel of John. Now the problem with that is in Scripture there are several Johns, so which John are we talking about? I will tell you that we are not talking about John the Baptist. I know we're not talking about John the Baptist because we'll get to that verse here tonight, and it makes reference to John the Baptist. And I will also tell you, because I've read through the book of John in this particular instance, the Apostle John is not named in the book of John, but all of the other apostles are. And in, in place of his name, it is commonly throughout the book of John referred to as uh, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. So in this particular instance, it is, it is commonly accepted that John, the young disciple, the one that Jesus loved, wrote the Gospel of John. As a matter of fact, in the first century, John had a, a disciple. So think about this. The apostles had disciples, and then they were teaching the church to create disciples. So <clears throat> the Apostle John's disciple was Polycarp. Polycarp, his disciple, because he learned from John that he's supposed to disciple someone, his name was Emmaus, Irenaeus, one of those two, Irenaeus. He lived somewhere between 130 to 200 A.D. So in this particular instance, he said that Polycarp told him, and Polycarp was the, the, the disciple of the Apostle John, that John wrote the gospel in his house in Ephesus. So there is very little question in theological circles that the Apostle John is the author of the book of John, originally titled According to John, but now commonly referred to as the Gospel of John, the good news. It is also, and I know some of you don't care about this, but it's one of those things that like, you do learn, so I have to pass it on. <clears throat> this was probably the last gospel book written. So John, the apostle, had the opportunity to read Matthew, Mark, and Luke before he ever wrote his gospel. <clears throat> Normally, they will date it to about 50 years after the death of Jesus when the gospel of John was written. So it's the last of the four Gospels that were written, and we're going to, I, I love this, I love the fact that it's the last of the four Gospels that's written, because really and truly, if I was on a team of individuals, and I had an ability to read all of their reports, what I would want to do when I sat down and wrote my report is I would want to fill in the blanks. And that's part of what John does for us. He gives us some information in clarity that the other three Gospels don't give us. And this is simple stuff, and many of you won't need what we're going to talk about tonight, but it's in the Word of God, and if God cared enough to write it down for us, then it is good enough for us to read it, to understand it, and then to put it into practice. So when we look at the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we're not going to get that far. We're not getting to chapter 2. Yeah, we're not getting to chapter 2. <clears throat> When we look at these simple things, yes, they are simple things, but even in their simplicity, God saw to it that we have them written down for factual evidence. So we're going to get excited tonight about simple things. Amen? Okay. Now we'll start. Sorry, before we do that, we should... Miss Amy, would you mind saying a prayer for us before we get started our service? Okay. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, this is one of those things that like, you, you sort of have to have a little bit of theological experience to understand this. You notice that the word, Word, is capitalized. So in this particular instance in the Bible, when the Word is capitalized, they're making reference to God. So here it says, in the beginning was God. But it uses the word, Word. So in this particular instance, we start to see 
an explanation of, although not clearly, the Trinity. Because we're really only going to talk about two things here initially. And, and in this particular instance, I will be willing to admit that the word Trinity is not included anywhere in the Gospel of John. So I don't want you to think that I'm trying to twist your thinking, but I want you to see how God has written this for us so that we can follow the evidence and then come to a rational conclusion that this is what he's talking about. So in this particular instance, many of you have asked me, like, how do you explain the Trinity? And this is one of those things that not everybody understands it the same way. Not everybody explains it the same way. And to be honest... We're all a little confused because it makes sense to us the way we think of it, but it's asking me to explain what makes sense to me to Brother Kurt. Kurt may think that I'm just completely off my rocker because he thinks of things differently. So in this particular instance, as in the beginning was the Word. The Word is capitalized. The Word is talking about God. So we see here a, a, an equation between God and the Word. And the Word was with God. Now, this is confusing because it says that the Word was with God, and then it said the Word was God. Now, if you don't know John at all, if you didn't know that John was apostle, if you just sat down and started reading the book of John, you would read verse 1 and go, this guy was definitely smoking something. And yes, he's aged at this point, but you have to understand that this was the beloved disciple. This is the one that Jesus loved. And he has read the other three Gospels, and he's read the other three Gospels, and the first thing he wants us to know is that maybe the other three Gospels didn't explain it quite this way, so I'm going to start with the first thing, and I want you to know that it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we don't have a complete trinity here because we have the Word and we have God. But we clearly have chapter 1, verse 1, saying that the Word and God are interchangeable. They equate. There's an equality to it. And this is just in verse 1. This is the first thing that the beloved disciple wants us to know about God. That in the beginning, He was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the word was God. How you translate that out in your own mind should puzzle you. It should actually encourage you to think, what is it that John's trying to explain here? This should encourage you to think deeply about what it is, the message that John is trying to deliver. And not just John, but John is encouraged, inspired by God, which also is the word. See, this is why sometimes when I get up here, I say the Word is alive. Because God is alive. So in this particular instance, I want you to see John chapter 1, verse 1, is letting us know that the Word, ladies and gentlemen, is powerful. It's more than just some writing on a page. It's actually equivalent with God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. So in the first verse, he says that the Word was with God and the Word was God. So we're trying to understand. We're struggling with the fact that the Word and God are somewhat similar. And then he gives the Word, the masculine pronoun, He. He was in the beginning with God. He, the Word. He, God. Also capitalized. Not just because it's the beginning of the sentence. i got to be honest. They didn't care much about the beginning of sentences at all. Or punctuation. <laughs> but there's a masculine pronoun for the word that was synonymous with God. Ladies, don't get offended here. I'm just reading what the Bible says. Verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Woo! This is almost the end of the message. Not really. we got a long way to go. <laughs> Do you see what he said here? That in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he gives the Word, the masculine pronoun he, and he says that all things, all things, all things, not some things, not occasionally, 
all things were made through him. Through who? Through the word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Everything that was made came through what? The word. The masculine pronoun for the word that is synonymous with God. So yes, he's telling us that God made everything, but he's also telling us more than God made everything, that we're not quite contemplating God in his entirety. We seem to think of God mostly as this genie who we can pray to, and he gives us good things, and he punishes us when we do things that are wrong. But God is bigger than that. He's harder to explain than that. He's not a genie that you can just rub the lamp and then get your wishes. That's not how God works. God, in the beginning, was God, but was also the Word. And everything that was made, and everything was made, because nothing existed before Him, was made through the Word, which is synonymous with God. This is where the Trinity starts to take shape for us, ladies and gentlemen, because he's saying here that our understanding of God is not complete, that you need to also include the Word with God. He's expanding our minds. This is the beloved apostle who wants us to know. He's read the first three Gospels, and they kind of missed something. They didn't quite explain how big God was. It's true. Without struggling with verses 1, 2, and 3, it's easy for me to say the word God and think Zeus or Apollo. It's easy for me to, to, to preform an opinion of what God is, but John doesn't want me to have a preformed opinion of what God is. He wants me to understand that God, ladies and gentlemen, is larger than your preformed idea. There's more to him than what you think. You think God can do this or God can't do that, and he's saying, no, 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 everything that was made came from God. Not just God, but the Word. There was also God. There was given the masculine pronoun. So in this particular instance, he wants you to think of God, but he wants you to think larger than God. He wants you to think about the Word. He wants you to think about God. And he wants you to somehow come to the rational conclusion that God is both. We're just talking about two right now. I get it. It gets more complicated. <clears throat> Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now remember, this is the beloved apostle who's trying to let us know something that the first three guys just didn't quite cover enough. And so far he's asked us in those first three verses to understand that God is bigger than we think. And ladies and gentlemen, if that doesn't excite you, you're not thinking about this right God says, however it is you're thinking about me, no, no, there's more to it than that. That's a wonderful thing. God is saying, hey, no matter how good you think I am, I'm better than that. No matter how big you think I am, I'm bigger than that. No matter what you're thinking about that was made, I did all of that. And the next thing in him was life. And the life was the light of man. He, he's bigger than we think, and he is life. He's life, and the life was the light of men. He, he's not just life, take it or leave it. He's like, woohoo, there's so much life here, boom, you got it. You can't think of God in that smaller context and think that that's the powerful being who spoke and the entire universe leapt into existence. No, no, he wants you to understand that he's so much larger than what you're thinking, that he is life, and that with that life, he brings light unto us. We need him because he's light, and without light, we're just in darkness. Verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness... And the darkness did not comprehend it. Oh. Oh. In those first three verses, I want you to think about God larger than you're thinking of God. In the next two verses, I want you to see what God has done for you. He created everything, and he, he is actual life. And that life brings us light. And then it says, And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness, ladies and gentlemen, is sin. It, it's the world without light. 
It's the world without salvation. And then he says, and the darkness, the darkness didn't understand the light. Point number one. Thank you, Rocky. <laughs> He's talking about Jesus. Now see, those first three Gospels did a very good job of telling us where Jesus was born and when he was born and all the miracles that he had conducted. But in the fourth gospel, we get, no, no, it's not just that he was born. It's not just that he met all of those Old Testament prophecies. That's just not it. That he was in the beginning. He was with God and he was God. He's bigger than you can explain and he's bigger than you think that he is. And that he is the life of men. And that that life showed up and the darkness didn't understand him. And that's how we all responded to Jesus, amen? It is. Like when somebody tried to tell you about Jesus, you're like, yeah, yeah. Get to, this, get to this, the good stuff. And it, you can't pass the good stuff for the better stuff because he's talking about Jesus and it's good stuff. But we didn't understand it. And we didn't understand it, ladies and gentlemen, because we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. And we couldn't comprehend that type of love that would go to the cross and die for us because we're just not worthy of that type of love. We didn't comprehend what it was Jesus was trying to do on the cross. Jesus came into the world and the world knew him not. We could not comprehend that level of love. Sadly, we still don't. Even in the church, when we go through the prayer list, we see some people on the prayer list and go, oh, it's too late for them. It's never too late. Because our God is bigger than whatever the problem is. Because everything that was made was made by God. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, in this particular instance, you, you could actually start to ask this question again. Which John? So let's see what man they're talking about. I'm going to try to hurry up a little bit. So we're going to go to verse 7. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. In this particular instance, I believe that he's just clarified for us. He is talking about John the Baptist here. Why? Because John the Baptist was the one that came before Jesus as a man crying off in the wilderness to make straight the paths for the Messiah's coming. <clears throat> Verse 8. He was not that light, but sent to bear witness of the light. So John the Baptist was not God. John the Baptist was not the Messiah, but he came to bear witness of the Messiah. And that's what John the Baptist did. Verse 9. That was the true light which gives life to every man coming into the world. Woo! Verse 9, you should underline. Verse 9, you should underline because it says that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So what we see here is we see that the Apostle John, that the, the beloved disciple of, of Jesus, wants us to know that God is bigger than our imaginations, that God is responsible for everything, that we didn't understand him, but that there was a man that came before Jesus to let us know that, that we should be making straight our paths, but he was not the light, but he was making a path for the light so that when the light got here, we would know. And then I love this part in verse 9. He says, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into this world. Point number two. Thank you, Rocky. Notice it says every man. That's those people on the prayer list that you thought a little while ago it was too late for them. It's not too late for them because Jesus came into the world to be the light to every man. That means even those people that you're thinking of right now that aren't good enough to receive the light, they just don't understand the light because they're still in their darkness. They're still in their sin and they're still in their trespasses, but Jesus came for them too. He just needs us to do our part so that we can be bearers of the light. The good news, the gospel message, it's Thanksgiving. Woohoo! We should be excited. You woke up this morning, you're blessed. You got out of bed this morning, you're blessed. 
You, you turn the light switch on and electricity still works, you're blessed. There are people in the world that don't have electricity switches. There are people in America that didn't pay their bill and they've flipped that switch all they want. The power is not coming on. But you're blessed. And we're supposed to be taking that blessing into the rest of the world because the darkness still does not understand. All right, we're going to stop at point two. I didn't get to point three. And it's already gone over my time. <clears throat> Let's have a quick prayer. Whew, dear Lord, be with us for the rest of this week. Be with us tomorrow at the senior adult rally so we can show the world your light. Help us, dear God, to see someone in their darkness and to reach out to them so that they can, dear Lord, know the light. And allow us, dear God, to contemplate your word, to study your word, to think about it, to grow, dear Lord, to be challenged by it so that we can become more like Christ and less like who we are. Amen.